Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. We're starting a brand new series today called Improve Your Serve. And I was gonna wear my tennis outfit and bring a tennis racket, but the staff said that my shorts were too short and that it was inappropriate for church, so they asked me not to wear my tennis outfit today. I thought I looked good. I thought I looked good, but you know. Many times we think we're doing a good job because we've reached our own goals. We set goals and we reach those goals. And so because we did those goals, we feel like we're doing a good job at life. But maybe I could challenge you today in the thesis of this message and this series is kind of this, like, wonder if the goals that you're setting are way too low compared to what God has set for you in your life. Right? I mean, I could go to the gym and set a goal to bench press 135 pounds. That's way beneath what I can actually do because I'm a buff giant in the gym. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like what does it matter that you set a goal that you can easily obtain, but are you setting goals according to the word of God? So each year, my family and I, we set goals. We sit down and we kind of like say, okay, what do we want to accomplish this year? Is there a project that we want to do in the house? Is there a financial goal that we want to meet? Is there a giving goal that we want to meet? What, what do we want to get done and accomplish throughout this year? And we set those goals, and at the end of the year, we revisit it and say, well, how do we do? Did we accomplish the goals that we set out? Here on staff, uh, at the beginning of the year, we do annual reviews and evaluations, and every staff member has to set some goals for what they're gonna accomplish throughout the year. And then mid-year, uh, which we're a little bit behind, we're doing them right now, the first question is, did you accomplish the goals that you set at the beginning of the year? And it's one of those like reality checks for the staff that be like, I have not worked on my goals. Okay, well that's a problem because we're, we are going to accomplish something here. We're not just gonna come do a job every day. But my family, we sit back and we take a look at what we've done. And sometimes that's not a pleasant thing. It's not a pleasant thing sometimes to look at, I wasted an entire year and I didn't do any of the projects or goals that I set out to do. Sometimes the worst thing is to set goals of, I'm going to get in shape this year as a New Year's resolution. Because it normally at lasts to the end of January, and then come February, you're no longer in the gym. <laughs> right, come on, can we be for real? Right, and I set the goal, but I didn't really do anything to meet it. And sometimes we find ourselves in areas of glaring failures, where we knew that we could perform much better, but we performed way below our ability. When staff bring me projects, they, say, they bring me a project and they're like, all right, Pastor Mike, I want you to take a look at this. Before I give you my opinion, I say, how do you feel about it? How do you feel about what you're presenting me right now? Because if you're not happy with the project that you're presenting me, let's reschedule this appointment and we'll present it another day, right? I don't want you to present something to me just because you wanted to meet the deadline. I want you to be proud of the project, knowing that you put your highest ability into this project. Can, can I say a lot of us, sometimes we work way below, way below our ability. If I asked you, do you bring 100% of yourself to your job every single day? No. I hate my job. They don't pay me enough to do all that. You might want to quit and go get a job that you can bring 100% because you'll be a lot happier and more fulfilled. I know, I know, we don't wanna talk this way, but anyway, I look back and I'm like, man, I could have did so much better if I just planned a little bit better, if I put more time in it, but in order for us to see the truth about our lives, the way God sees it, uh, God requires, he requires us to lay down our pride sometimes and be honest with ourselves. Can I ask you a question today? I'm not making any judgment calls. I'm asking you to judge yourself. 
Are you giving God your best every day? Do you give God your best? Now for me, my best is early morning. I'm awake, I'm alert, I function better in the morning. Other people, if you're not a morning person, do not try to pray and do your devotions in the morning. Don't do, like, don't do that, and don't even get guilty about it. That's not your best. If your best is late at night, then do your prayer and devotion time at night, right? Don't compare yourself to somebody else, but what's your best? So for us as a family, in the end, we're always glad that we did a review because it helps us to acknowledge the places that we have fallen short. And it also gives us time to rejoice over what God has done and was able to accomplish in our lives. I would say this to the married couples, have you set marriage goals lately? Relationship goals? Are you gonna take a vacation alone together this year? Are we gonna do a date once a week, once a month? Setting some relationship goals and making sure that you meet those will seriously enhance your marriage. Okay, that was free information. We also wanna make sure that we're on the right course and that we're focusing on what's effective and functional in our lives. When other people come to us and say, wow, you guys are doing so much around here at the church and you, it's like you always have a project going at your house. To us, it doesn't seem like it because we're just accomplishing the goals that we set. But we realize that people do see the fruit in our lives for the fact that we set goals and we're constantly revisiting them and going after them, okay? It's important though to ask yourself this. Um, where am I measuring my success and is it in a healthy place? I told the church this a few months ago that we as a church find ourselves in a very strange position is that we don't really have anybody to compare ourselves to to know if what we're doing is a good job. Now there's churches that are 10,000 people, that's way too big, we can't compare ourselves to that. There's people who are churches of 250, that's too small, we can't compare ourselves to that. But our vision, what we're supposed to do in the Northeast, how do we set goals and how do we know if what we're doing is good? There has to be a way that you can measure success and whether what you're doing is good. Now watch this, 2 Corinthians 10, Paul tells us that there is this, there's a pitfall that we can find ourselves in when it comes to measuring success. Watch what he says, in 2 Corinthians 10, 12, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. You ever met someone who just brags about themselves all the time? How awesome they are, how great they are, how cool their beard looks on stage. You ever met someone like that? I mean, it can be kind of annoying sometimes, you know what I'm saying? We do not dare classify ourselves or compare ourselves with someone who commend themselves when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves they're not wise. Check out what that says. You compare yourself with yourself, so what? That's saying, look, I'm so successful. I set goals and I accomplish them. But you set mediocre goals at best. So just because you accomplished the goal that you set doesn't mean you did anything great. That's hard, isn't it? That's a tough one. But that, does that, is that really what it's saying? Watch this. We, however, will not boast beyond proper limits, but will confine our boasting to the sphere of service to God. The service that God himself assigned to us. So check this out. There is a service. There is something that God has assigned to you to accomplish. There is a task, there's a mission, there's a purpose, there's a destiny that God has assigned to each and every one of us to accomplish. 
whether we like it or not, whether we like the mission or not, whether we like the task or not, but let me tell you something about God. God's a good God. God's a good God. Because this kind of stuff always scared me. It always scared me to think, well, God is going to make me a missionary to a third world country that has no technology. Like, just now, I can't eat weird food. You know, you hear about those tribes that you go and they chew on something and they spit it in a bowl and they stir it up and everybody's got to eat. I'm like, nah, I can't do that. Don't make me a missionary, God. But we serve a good God, don't we? I'm telling you right now, the purpose that God has placed in your heart and in your life will line up with what you already enjoy doing in life. I'm telling you, it will. It will, that's a good God. The Bible tells us as parents, train up a child in the way they naturally bend. So why would God do the opposite? Why would God give you an assignment or a purpose or a destiny that was in the opposite direction of who you are and who he made you to be? That'd be foolishness. But we will confine our boasting to the sphere of service. God himself has assigned to us a sphere that also includes you. So he's saying, I'm not alone in this. This means our measuring stick should never be how we measure up to other human beings or how we measure to our own goals. Because compared to them, we may have done well. Compared to somebody else, I may have done well. According to all my other friends that are 42 years old, my life is pretty good. So what? Take the list, it's like, this is a metaphor though, I'm just, take the list that you set and turn, flip it over, and now let's compare our lives to the list that God has for us. All right, you accomplished all your goals, but when we flip that page over and start reading the word of God, did we accomplish the goals that God has assigned to us? Now, this is not judgment. This should not condemn us. This should be kind of like a wake up like, Oh, shoot, I hadn't even started my chore list yet. <laughs> Growing up in my house as a kid, Saturday morning, you knew that mom was gonna wake you up on Saturday morning vacuuming the hallway with the most annoying song in the world. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. And she would take the vacuum and hit it into the door. Like, mom, leave me alone, slaving. And you knew that when you got up and went to the kitchen to get your Cocoa Pebbles or Cocoa Krispies or whatever you were gonna have for breakfast, there was gonna be a chore list on the countertop with your name. There's Mike, there's Kathy, there's Joe. The dog even had a chore list, I think. <laughs> it was never more than 10 things because you're not gonna get more than 10 things accomplished in a day. But let me tell you, I hated chore lists. I did. I hated chore lists. And I think that's kind of what has happened in life today and in Christianity today. Don't give me a list, God. I'm tired of lists. Tell me what to do. That's okay. But do you want to accomplish purpose? Do you want to accomplish purpose? If we want to accomplish purpose then maybe we should look at what the standard is. Maybe we should take a look at the list. Maybe we should see what's on the other side of the paper that we've been writing on and see what God has written. We can be deceived by our own accomplishments because maybe we marked off some big things on our lists. But I, am I accomplishing the goals that the Lord has set for me. We need to remember that in this Christian life, the paper that we write our goals on is double-sided. We have our goals, we have our plans, we have our dreams, but God has a set of dreams for your life that are far beyond anything you could ever think or imagine, the Bible says. 
that he has goals set for you beyond what you could ever think or imagine. And I'm just telling you today that we're settling for the wrong side of the paper. We're settling for human limitations instead of divine design. We're settling for our weaknesses and our failures and our frailties, and we're not flipping the page of life over and looking at spiritually who God created us to be. We need to flip the page over. You need to flip the page over in your life. And I'll be honest, I think upstate New York, I think New York, I think the Northeast, we, we have still PTSD from this COVID thing. And we're still kind of shut down emotionally. And we're still kind of shut down energy. And we're still kind of shut down with fear. I don't know what to do. I'm just going to kind of just coast right now. I'm just going to wait to see what's happening. And we're not accomplishing things that God has set in front of us. So what does the Bible say? Let's take a look at something in the Bible today. It says, when Paul was in prison in Rome, he had a lot of time to think. I mean, if you're chained to a wall, what else you got to do? Sit there and think. So he sat there in prison and reflected on his life and his achievements. He thought about what he had done, what he hadn't done, and what he still needed to do. Isn't it funny that you really don't think about all the things that you still need to do in life until you get sick? No, life is too short. But you wasted 10 years on Netflix. I mean, you binge watched every single popular series. Now I'm sick. No! I gotta be here for my family! But you hadn't been there for them for the last 15 years. I'm not, I'm not throwing shade. I'm saying, yo, let's reflect. Let's reflect. He thought about what he still needed to do, and Paul was tempted. Paul was tempted to look back at his life and compare it to other people. Hey, well, you know what? Compared to so-and-so, I'm killing it. Or maybe you're on the more neurotic side. Hey, I know that I'm messing up, but I'm not messing up as bad as they are. He had preached all around the Mediterranean Sea. He had preached in the imperial palace. He had started churches all over Asia Minor. He had written most of the New Testament. He was one of the greatest apostles of his generation. And he could have easily sat back and rightfully told himself, I've done more than most men will ever dream of doing. I've done more than five people will ever do in their lifetime. But rather than reveal his own accomplishments, Paul used this time in prison to truthfully assess his life. And he wrote these famous words. Ready? I'm about to preach a very popular, popular scripture in a way that you've never seen it before. I'm going to bring some liberty to some people today, okay? Ready? Philippians 3.13. Philippians 3.13. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have arrived or have taken a hold of it. I do not consider myself to have achieved greatness or come to perfection. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I'm pressing towards God's goals, not my goals. Now, have you heard this scripture before? He says, I do not count myself to have apprehended. I do not count myself to have apprehended. And the word count not gives us insight to the way that Paul views his life. Paul borrows the word from bookkeeping. And the Greek word is, I'm going to butcher this one right now, lagizoma. Okay? which originally meant to mathematically count, calculate, or tabulate. Or to say, okay, I'm taking into consideration all the things, and here is my conclusion. 
The word was primarily used in bookkeeping world to portray the idea of a balance sheet or something called profits and losses. Bookkeepers would take these at the end of the year and say, okay, how much did we spend? How much came in? Are we in profit? Are we in loss? And you might think that your business is doing quite well, but when the bookkeeper adds up all the numbers and hands you the profit and loss sheet, that's the moment you're gonna know how well you did. You don't have to guess anymore. The numbers are in front of you. Here's how much you made. Here's how much you spent. You spent more than you made, right? Or you made more than you spent. So why did Paul use these words? Why did he go into this and say, I've mathematically calculated. I mathematically calculated that I have not arrived there yet. It is obvious that Paul was doing some serious reviewing of his life. And rather than guess how well he's doing, well, hey, compared to these other guys sitting here in prison, I did really great. Instead of doing that, instead of aimlessly living life, I, I'm amazed at how many people never actually balance their checking account, and they just open up their app, oh, I got money, I'm gonna go spend. But you don't know if you have any outstanding payments that you've already put through. Right? A lot of people just do that aimlessly. I don't, I don't really know. I, mean, I think I'm doing pretty good money-wise. Paul carefully reviewed the original goals that God had given him. He flips the page over and says, okay, according to what God has called me to do, I need to make a list to see where I'm at. And it's almost as if Paul had written God's plan for his life on one side of the paper and what he had actually accomplished on the other side of the paper. And after looking at the original goal and truthfully assessing how much he had done, he wrote, mathematically, I haven't arrived yet. I count not myself to have apprehended. I have not accomplished all the things that God has set up. Why? Because Paul's deciding, is it time for me to die or not? And he says, I can't. I can't let myself die because I haven't apprehended yet. I haven't finished all the things that God said. So he goes on to say, he's like, what's more beneficial? I want to go home and be with the Lord. I'm good. I'm done with all this. But it's more benefit that I stay because I have not yet apprehended the goals that God has set in my life. On my side of the page, I'm killing it. I've done so much. But when I flip the page over and look what God has actually called me to do, I haven't scratched the surface yet. Although Paul had accomplished a great deal in his ministry, he knew he hadn't done everything he was supposed to do. And that's why he knew it was not his time to die. His prison situation was dreadful and the legal prognosis didn't look good. But Paul knew it wasn't time for him to leave yet because he still had so much work to do. Philippians 1, 22 through 26 says this. If I am going to go on living in my body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. Right? He's saying, do I stay? Do I go? If I stay here, I know I'll get more done on the list. I am torn between the two. I desire to part and to be with Christ, which is far better. I think we can all admit that. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for the progress and the joy in the faith so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ will abound on account of me. I'm sure Paul was thankful for everything that he had seen and that all that God had already done and accomplished through him. And this is why Paul says this. But this one thing I do, now, now, now this is where I'm gonna mess the theology up. This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching towards the prize of the high caller, I'm looking forward. I wanna look at this for a second. What is Paul choosing to forget? I forget those things which are behind. What is he choosing to forget? And a lot of us have been taught and we would believe 
well, he's forgetting all the bad things that he did. Because Paul's a really bad man. When he was Saul, Saul Tarsus, he was murdering Christians and enforcing the law. But could I challenge you today that Paul had already dealt with his past? He had already dealt with his failure. He had like 14 years between the Damascus Road experience and before he began ministry. 14 years of call, separation, and preparation. Are you telling me that in 14 years he didn't deal with his past? The man who teaches grace, the man who teaches God's forgiveness, couldn't forgive himself? No. No. Do you know what I think Paul had to put behind himself? His successes. Because the enemy of future success is past success. But look at everything I've done. I can just coast now. No. Your last success was a stepping stone for your next success. The more we keep looking at our successes and pinning them up on the wall, and I mean, that's kind of part of the problem with trophy cases. You know what, you know, if you were, like, you made a big accomplishment in college or high school and they put your trophy in the, in the case, where do you have to go to go look at that trophy? Back to high school. Back to college. You got to go backwards to go visit your past success. And you can get stuck there. And Paul says, if I'm going to press towards the mark... The bigger goals, the prize of the high calling, the goals that God has set, I've got to put my own personal successes behind me. Dude, that's big. That's big. That's why he says, I can't compare myself to myself. Because if I compare myself to myself, dude, I'm killing it. Killing it. But have I accomplished all that God, can I talk to some, can I talk to some people that are maybe a little older than me? You got to understand the seasons of life, and I don't ever want anybody to get down on themselves. The seasons of life that we go through. Once you choose to get married and be parents, sometimes goals and things change. And in that season of parenting, your number one mission in life is to raise those kids. Amen. And to raise them well. Amen. And to provide for them. Amen. And to create a stable home for them. And you know what? That might mean that some of your goals and some of the goals that even God has set out for you kind of go on hold. God's not upset about that. But we made decisions. We made choices to get married and we made decisions to have kids. And so because of that, there's some responsibilities that come with that. But what a great season when you've done your job. When you've raised your kids, and you've raised them well, and you say, you know what, God? I've raised my kids, I've done it well, I'm now going to move forward again in the call and the plans and the purposes that you have put in front of me. Yeah, but all those wasted, wasted on what? Raising great kids? That's not wasted. That's not wasted time. That's not wasted dreams. That's not wasted visions. That's called legacy. Investing in a future that's going to way outlive you. That's godly. Jesus did that with his 12 disciples. He made sure that he invested everything he was into another generation so it could keep going. Now Paul is saying, I'm putting behind my successes and my accomplishments. You see, the greatest enemy of future success is past success. And this is what has happened in our own lives. Paul is doing this because stopping at past victories is what keeps most people from moving forward to future victories. We stand at the trophy case. Man, remember the good old days? Remember back when we were on football team together? Remember back in college? Okay, what have we done since college? What have we done since the last victory? What have we done since the last improvement on our house? Great. 
We, got, we, we remodeled the bathroom, but we screamed at each other the whole time. People become so fixated on what they've done that they lose sight of what they need to do. And that keeps them from moving forward to possess new territory that God has for you. Pastor Mike, but what does goal setting and accomplishments have to do with serving and improving your serve? Well, I'm so glad you asked that question today. It's everything. Because maybe, just maybe, if we would take time to align our goals and our plans with those on the other side of the paper, with the ones that God wrote for us before the foundation of the earth, the God who knows all things, the creator of all things, he knew that there would be a year called 2021 that you would be alive and he had a plan for what you would accomplish. And he said, you know what? In the year 2021, I'm gonna need a people that will serve me. I need a people that I can call on, that I can use in a time of pandemic, in a time of turmoil, in a time of wars and rumors of wars and pestilence and earthquakes and floods. I'm going to need a people. And he so decided that you were the person to be created and to live in this generation at this season for pandemics and earthquakes and floods and wars. He said, you are my people to take my mission forward. Well, God, I don't, I mean, I don't want to sign up for that. But you're here. But you're here. We're here now. It's happening now. You're alive now. So let's do it. Hebrews 6.10. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love that you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. I mean, how great is this? How great is this? He's saying that the highest calling is serving. He said the highest calling is serving. The highest goal, the highest, the, 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 the God who made himself a little lower than the angels so that he could be with humanity did not come to be served. It was almost awkward for him, for Mary to break open her alabaster box of oil and wash his feet with oil and dry it with her hair. It was almost awkward for him because he was like, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. I came to wash your feet. I came to be a sacrifice for you. That's, that's the mission of heaven. Galatians 5.13, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but not to use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. And I, we can struggle with that one, can't we? Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour each other. I mean, are we not seeing this right now? You can't say nothing right today. You can't say nothing right. You say one opinion, and someone on the other side is gonna rip your head off. You don't say nothing, because I'm not getting involved. Your silence is part of the problem. I don't even know. I don't even know. But if you bite and devour each other, watch out, you will be destroyed by each other. Could that be prophetic to where our country is? So I say, walk in the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walk in the spirit. Are you serving God your best each day? Are you stepping out of what the desires of the flesh may lead you to be doing and say, Lord, I want to operate in the realm of the spirit in my life today. If we could measure ourselves according to the word of God 
and the mission that God has placed within each of us, we would be more fulfilled and have a stronger sense of accomplishment. If we would flip the page over and say, God, what would you have for me today? And wouldn't it be wonderful if I just gave you a whole list of things that God's called you to do right now and make it really easy for you? Yeah, I'm not going to. I'm not gonna do that. Um, one, because each and every one of us' mission is so unique, it's like your fingerprint. You're supposed to have conversations with people that I will never have. You're supposed to go places that I'm not supposed to go. Each of us has a mission to serve him. My big idea today is this, how could you improve your serve in the kingdom of God? How could you improve your serve in the kingdom of God? Not measuring yourself by yourself, not measuring yourself compared to, well, I serve others way better than everybody else I know. Oh, great, there you go. You got a reward. Flip the page over and say, Lord, what have you created me to do in this life? Before there's an end date on a tombstone that will decay, what am I to accomplish? What's my mission in this life? Have I emptied all my knowledge and my experience into somebody else that can carry that on? Have I put on paper a story that I need to write? a book that I need to put together? Have I created um, a video that I'm supposed to make? Have I started a business that I'm supposed to start? Have I written a song that I'm supposed to sing? These are all things that improve your serve in the kingdom of God. Can I pray for you today? Father, we come to the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray. that we would not compare ourselves to ourselves or with ourselves, but we would look into the word of God as to what you've called us to accomplish in this life. I pray, God, when we journey down that road that we would not grow weary in well-doing, but we would do what you have placed in front of us. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to empower us, anoint us for this season. I thank you, Lord, that you are our ever-present help in time of need. If you're here today and you've never had the opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, we would like to offer that to you today, and it's not something strange. We're not gonna call you forward to embarrass you, but right where you are in your seat, like, you know what? I wanna set these goals, and I wanna know what's happening in my life, but I don't yet know God. I haven't surrendered my life to Jesus Christ yet to even begin this journey. If you're here today and you would like to accept Christ today, we'd love to offer that to you and we pray a prayer together and it goes like this if you repeat it with me. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time and you're watching online, would you type amen in one of our chat rooms? One of our online hosts would love to follow up with you and send you a six-day devotional called Starting Point. If you're in the room today and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you allow me the honor to celebrate you for two seconds? Would you just wave at me and say, hey, that was me. Yeah, I see you. Anybody else real quick across the room? Yeah, oh, yeah, I see you. Awesome. Welcome, welcome. Yeah, I see you, yeah. Hey, we have that same starting point devotional right outside the doors at the Welcome Center. You can say, hey, I raised my hand today. Could I have the starting point book? It's a great six-day devotional. Before you leave, if you need prayer for any reason, we will have care team members right here at the front and at the high top tables in the lobby. If you need to connect with somebody, you came to church for a reason today. If you have not yet received what you were looking for, don't leave here without getting it, okay? You need a hug, you need a handshake, you need a high five, whatever it is, connect with somebody before you leave here today. Father, we thank you that your word will never return void, but it will accomplish exactly what you set it forth to do. We thank you, Lord, that we are protected and safe. We are blessed coming in, we'll be blessed going out. Everything we set our hands to will prosper and be successful in Jesus' name, amen. Love you. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. 
First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.